Good morning. My name's Katie Rose. I'm the STEM program assistant here at Union Station in Science City. Thank you guys so much for being here this morning. I know it's early and gloomy. Um, students, see me after, and I can stamp your notes up at the front desk. Um, now, please allow me to introduce our speaker today, Stephanie Ramirez. She is a speech language pathologist at North Kansas City Hospital. She's also certified a uh, certified dementia care specialist and primarily works in the outpatient setting. Ladies and gentlemen, Ms. Stephanie Ramirez. We'll take this off. Stand still. Good morning. Thank you guys so much for coming out. Um, I am so excited to be here talking about two areas that I am very passionate about. Um, speech language pathology and music. And I think a lot of us know how to exercise our bodies. We have total gyms that have all the equipment that we could possibly need. But when it comes to our brain, a lot of people don't know what to do for that. And I would argue that it's even more important to exercise your brain. So hopefully today you'll get some ideas for how music can be used as a tool to keep your brain sharp. So a little bit about me. I am the lead speech language pathologist at North Kansas City Hospital. I have been working in the field for about 14 years now. Um, I also am a musician. So I, play, I started playing the piano when I was about eight years old. And I learned the clarinet and the trombone. Um, I went to high school out in California. So we had you know, all northern, all state honor bands, I was active in that, and I've been to um, the United States honor band and got to go around Europe, so music has been a huge part of my life. And you might be wondering, Stephanie, what does speech therapy have to do with music? And in the words of Buddy the Elf, I will say it's just like talking, except it's longer, louder, and you move your voice up and down. So today's plan is to learn the science of speech language pathology, to learn about the parts of the brain, to learn how music can exercise your brain, and to learn how music can be used in therapy. So whenever a person engages in music, when a piano student practices a scale, a jazz saxophonist riffs on a solo, a teenager cries in their room to a sad song or a wedding guest gets down on the dance floor. Countless neurons are firing. Music is one of the most complex things that our brain processes and it is definitely an amazing tool. So to give you a little bit of background, a speech language pathologist is a rehabilitation specialist um, that primarily focuses, I like to say, on everything from the neck up. So we work closely with physical and occupational therapists who work on walking and balance and um, all of those lower body things. We are responsible for everything from the neck up. So that can include all kinds of things. Um, we work with people of all ages. Um, my youngest patient in the neonatal intensive care unit was actually about three days old, and my oldest patient was over 100. So we work across the lifespan. Um, we work in schools and private practices and different rehabilitation clinics. Obviously, hospitals is a, a big area for us as well. And so you'll see um, kind of all the different areas that we can focus on. So fluency would be things like stuttering, um, we work on speech and articulation. We work on augmentative and alternative communication for people that cannot communicate verbally. We also um, work on auditory rehabilitation, so being able to understand and interpret sounds coming in. We work on feeding and swallowing in both children and adults. So when I'm talking about being in the NICU, a lot of times I'm working with those babies on eating. Um, we work on voice and resonance. Um, and we work on expressive and receptive language, so being able to not only understand language as it's coming in, but express the words you want to say going out. We also work on social communication 
And then finally, my favorite area, which is cognitive communication. So cognition involves all of those brain processes, memory, problem solving, attention, decision making. And a lot of conditions really affect a person's ability to do those things. And so as a speech language pathologist, I can work with these patients and try to help make their brains um, function better. And we do that by a combination of strategy training and exercise. So there is actually a lot of science that goes into the field of speech pathology. Like I said, we work on everything from the neck up. So the brain is a huge part of that. And so the neuroscience of speech pathology includes um, a very detailed understanding of neuroanatomy and neurophysiology, basically the parts of your brain and how they work. We have to understand that because if we have a patient coming in with a certain condition, we have to know how that condition is gonna in fact, impact the brain function and be able to develop goals to help that part of the brain work better. We have to have a really good understanding of acute and chronic neurological conditions. So acute conditions are things that happen suddenly. So things like a stroke or a concussion that can impact your brain. Chronic conditions are things that happen gradually over time, things like Parkinson's disease and dementia. We also, when working with children, have to have a really good understanding of neurodevelopment. And then the concept of neuroplasticity. Our brain is amazing in that it never stops learning. It never stops growing and building new neural pathways. And so when we have someone who has had some, something happen traumatic to their brain, their brain can actually reroute that information around the part of the brain that was damaged. And so that's part of what therapy is. I like to tell my patients, your brain is kind of like a super highway with you know, information buzzing along, four lanes going either direction. You have something happen, like a stroke or a concussion. Now two of those lanes are under construction. So what's gonna happen? The information is gonna go slower. There's gonna be backups. It's gonna be a little bit more frustrating to get through that area. But therapy can help clear those roadblocks and try to get patients functioning back at their normal level. Um, contrary to popular belief, the brain is not a muscle, it is an organ, but it acts like a muscle in the fact that you can exercise it to keep it healthy and functioning at its best. So a big foundation of my therapy is educating my patients on how they can exercise their brain. And a big part of that is music. So music not only affects us emotionally, but it has a physical effect on us as well. Music actually increases the body's production of antibodies, so it can improve your immune system. It also reduces the levels of the stress hormone cortisol and increases dopamine, so it can make us feel better. Learning to play music shapes the brain structure and function in young children, and music processing, or your ability to process music, tells us a lot about how you can learn. Music can improve language and cognitive function not only in children, but in adults as well, across the lifespan. So you'll see those brain scans. The one on the left is the brain at rest. And then, then on the right, you can see the brain and its reaction to music. Almost every single part of that brain is lighting up. So we're gonna talk a little bit about the parts of the brain so you can understand how each one of them is impacted by music. So the brain is composed of four lobes the frontal lobe, temporal lobe, parietal lobe, occipital lobe. We also have a cerebellum and the spinal cord, which connects the brain to the rest of the body. The brain is also divided into two hemispheres, left hemisphere and right hemisphere. And so each one of those lobes, sections of the brain, hemisphere is responsible for different um, thoughts and processes that our body does. And so we're gonna talk a little bit about each one and this is coming up on the interactive part, so everybody get excited and be ready to participate here. So our frontal lobe, that is located just behind your forehead. This is the boss of the brain. It involves thinking and decision making, your higher level cognitive tasks like planning, organizing, problem solving, multitasking. It controls our personality, our temperament, our mood, and our speech. And so with music, we use this part of the brain to really help 
express music. And music can actually help this part of the brain work better and more efficiently um, and make us better communicators. So in my practice, I see a lot of patients who have had a concussion. A concussion is a force to the brain that causes the brain to move around um, in the skull. Um, you can see here, usually it is in the front of the uh, the front of the brain, that frontal lobe, because it is, you know, could be a sports injury, it could be from a car accident. But I see a lot of these patients and they have trouble with all of those higher level thinking tasks, memory, problem solving, um, inhibition, changes in their mood. Um, they also have a lot of symptoms like light and sound sensitivity, headaches, nausea, dizziness. And so in my practice, we really focus on trying to keep those symptoms down so your brain can function better. If you're in a lot of pain, your brain is gonna be so distracted that you're not gonna be able to do any kind of higher level thinking. So to bring those symptoms down, a lot of times we talk about using rest breaks and relaxing music. A lot of times I tell people, try not to use music that has words because that'll distract you, you'll wanna sing along. Um, but if it's not, um, if it doesn't have any words, you can close your eyes, do some deep diaphragmatic breathing, and a lot of times that'll really help with keeping the pain down. So we're gonna all practice doing some deep diaphragmatic breaths with some relaxing music. So everybody, you can close your eyes. Don't fall asleep on me, but you're gonna close your eyes. I want you to breathe in through your nose and out through your mouth. Try to slow it down. All right, I feel more relaxed already. <laughs> so you guys, this, this is a really um, important piece. I know it seems kind of silly, but for these patients, a lot of times doing that can help bring their headache down to a manageable level. The next lobe that I want to talk about is the temporal lobe. So this is located just above the ears. This lobe is important for memory, hearing, processing, um, what we hear, understanding speech, both, again, expressive and receptive. Um, and with music, we use this part of the brain to analyze and enjoy music. Language, words are interpreted on the left side of the brain, while music and sounds are interpreted on the right side of the brain. And so in my practice, a lot of times I do see patients that have had a stroke. There are two kinds of stroke. We have ischemic stroke where there is a brain blockage. Um, there is also a hemorrhagic stroke where there is a, a brain bleed. And so in both cases, that part of the brain that has damage isn't gonna be able to function properly. So, the uh, impacts of that stroke, it's gonna depend on where in the brain it happened. But a lot of times when I'm working with patients, it happened in the left hemisphere, temporal lobe, and so they're having trouble with word finding. Um, maybe they can't think of what they wanna say, or their words come out and it's all gibberish. Um, a lot of times um, they kind of have what we call blocks, where they can't get a word out at all. Um, that language impairment after stroke we, we refer to as aphasia. And so we can use music with this population even though they can't get the word out in the moment, we know those words are still there. It's just their ability to access them and build those pathways around the damaged part. So a lot of times using music we can help bring words out. And there are some songs that I know, you know, the words by heart and you would never forget. And so we are going to practice. And so I want you to kind of listen to the melody and then when you recognize it, you can start singing along. Does everybody know what it is? We just had Christmas. <laughs> Jingle bells, jingle bells, jingle all the way. Oh, what fun it is to ride in a one-horse open sleigh. Jingle bells, jingle bells, jingle all the way. Oh, what fun it is to ride in a one-horse open sleigh. So I didn't have the words up there. If you weren't singing, I know you knew the words, okay? <laughs> 
But that's what I mean. Some of those things are so ingrained in our brain that we can use music as a tool to access the information even when the person is not able to do it um, on their own. The next section of the brain I want to talk about are the parietal lobes. These are located just behind the ears towards the back of your head. These are important for spatial judgment, integrating sensory information, reading, and writing. And so with music, these lobes are responsible for the cognitive and perceptual use of music materials, like learning sequences, pitches, and rhythms. It um, controls tactile feedback if you're dancing. Um, and so for this area, a lot of times I will use those principles of tactile feedback and pacing and rhythm with patients who stutter. Because stuttering is really just a, a rhythm issue. You know, your, your speech comes out a little bit slow and then too fast and then, you know. So what we do is we practice pacing. And a lot of times we'll use pacing boards like what you see up there and we'll have the patient tap along and we'll have a beat behind it so they can practice having fluent speech, something like this. I see the ball. I see the ball. So they can practice those things and they can feel what it feels like to use their strategies and have fluent speech. The occipital lobes are located in the back of the head, and they are important for vision, object recognition, and identifying color. Um, so with music, this lobe is involved with reading music or looking at your own dance moves. Musicians might visualize a musical score while playing music, and in fact, there are a lot of musicians who can't see at all. So people like Ray Charles, Stevie Wonder, Andrea Bocelli, um, those musicians are completely blind, but I know that in their mind, they are seeing the music. And so um, it's just very interesting that music can bring people of all kinds of abilities together. And um, just a little fun trivia fact, some people can see color when they hear music. And that ability is called synesthesia. So if you're ever wondering, but it's kind of interesting. Um, the cerebellum is located in the back of the head, just below the occipital lobe. This is used for coordination, fine motor movement, balance, walking, speech articulation, and it stores physical memory. So with music, musicians' abilities, dancers' abilities, become muscle memories. This, in, this area is involved in movement and balance when dancing or when playing a musical instrument. So one a uh, patient population that I work with that's considered a movement disorder is Parkinson's disease. So patients with Parkinson's come, with us, uh, come to us. Um, a lot of times they will work with physical and occupational therapy on their walking. They usually have a, a slow kind of shuffling gait, maybe poor balance. But they come to me for their voice. And that's because with Parkinson's, a lot of times people's voices get very soft and very mumbled and they don't realize it. To them, their voice sounds normal. Everyone else in the world has a hearing problem. It's not me. So what we use is a technique called LSVT, or the Lee Silverman Voice Training Program, to help build those muscle memories. And the whole concept of this program is to think loud. So that patient is prompted to do various exercises that are actually a lot of what you do in um, voice training or vo voice coaching and we do it at a loud volume, they practice that, so that way when they go out into the community and they're having a conversation, they're automatically gonna start using that loud voice. So we're gonna do a few of those exercises here today. Um, so the first one we teach our patients is just a long, loud awe. So I want you to take a big, deep breath and do what I do. So we're gonna take a breath and hold awe out as long as we can like this. Ah, good and loud. Do louder, louder, louder. Good, good breath support. Nice job. Very good, you guys. Very good. So I, I get a lot of funny looks when I come out of my office after these sessions because people hear us, you know, 
yelling, um, but it really is exciting because the patients get to hear their voice normal again for the first time. So we do that 15 times, and then we do our pitch glides up and down because a lot of times with Parkinson's as well, your voice becomes a little monotone. So I tell my patients, you're gonna think loud, you're gonna take a deep breath, we're gonna glide your voice up, ah, and then down, ah. Let's all try it. Ah, ah, good. And I tell people we don't have to sound like Celine Dion. <laughs> It's just getting those vocal cords moving and flexible and coming together. So we are really activating our cerebellums this morning. Okay, we're gonna dive just a little bit deeper into the subcortical structures. So these are the inner brain structures. The areas of the hippocampus, which is involved in memory, the hypothalamus, which is responsible for your body state, and the amygdala, which is involved in emotion regulation. So with music, this area of the brain really responds to the emotional reactions to music. Music can actually increase someone's memory and increase neuron generation in this area. Music can also, because of that body state regulation, cause heart rate and blood pressure to come down. So, this is, this is the part of the brain why we get so emotionally attached to music, why when we hear something it could make us laugh or cry, why those little earworm jingles from commercials stay in our brain so long, because they're tapping into this subcortical structure. Um, and so, what patient population do we really have trouble tapping in? It's dementia. And this is the, way, this is the area that music can really help unlock memories for someone with dementia. I started my career working in nursing homes, and so I had a lot of experience working with patients who were completely nonverbal. Um, they really just kind of sat in their chair all day, didn't have a lot of stimulation, and when they got to listen to music or go down to music programs, it just lit them up. They became a different person. And so I wanna share a video with you. You might have already seen it because it kind of went viral. Um, of a ballerina who had Alzheimer's and what music was able to do for her. Ella había sido una de, la, de las seleccionadas por este proyecto, habíamos visto que, que su caso podía ser interesante e hicimos una búsqueda de las canciones que, que ella había bailado cuando era joven ¿no? y que ella había incluso sido protagonista de muchas de ellas. Por suerte teníamos eh, escritos suyos antiguos donde ella relataba muchas de estas canciones. Eh, al fin y al cabo, cuando el, el, el día que nosotros la pudimos conocer, pues la podíamos ver un poco triste, la podíamos ver un poco nerviosa en algunos momentos y, y, y la verdad que no sabíamos con qué eficacia iba a tener eh, todo esto, ¿no? pero al escuchar la canción del Lago de los Cines, que fue la primera que ella escuchó, la verdad que se transformó completamente. Y, y parece que parte de su, de su mente y viajó a otro, a otro momento de su vida. La ciencia ya ha demostrado que efectivamente hay ciertas áreas relacionadas, áreas cerebrales relacionadas con la memoria musical de aquellas canciones que a cada persona le ha gustado y estas áreas cerebrales están menos atrofiadas que otras partes del cerebro en ese tipo de enfermedades. Eh, 
probablemente porque la música tiene un, un poder inmenso desde el principio de los tiempos, ¿no? Ya, ya en la prehistoria se encontraban instrumentos musicales, con lo cual parece que nuestro cerebro está preparado para ser un cerebro musical. Por supuesto, la música está absolutamente unida a las emociones. Eh, nosotros también decimos que es importante la música en la enfermedad de Alzheimer, pero más importante todavía es hacerle sentir emociones. Eh, se sientan vivos, que se sientan ese tipo de emociones, es muy importante, porque al final las emociones se asocian a momentos de nuestra vida. Tenemos vídeo de una, una mujer con 99. So, I think that video is just so powerful. Um, as a speech pathologist, a lot of times it's my job to work with patients and their families with dementia on ways to improve quality of life, communication, feeding, all of those things require us to be able to, to connect with that person. And when you have a person who is so far progressed in the disease that they don't respond, then music can be an amazing tool to help you connect with them. And um, a lot of times, you know, we associate Alzheimer's and other dementia with some negative behaviors. A lot of patients have what we call sundowning, where towards the end of the night, they start to get a little more agitated. Um, music has been shown to help with that. And so instead of medicating these patients and sedating them, turn to music first. Do something that's non-pharmaceutical that's going to bring them joy and comfort without putting um, you know, medication in their body. So we know that music works out the whole brain, but it also works our brain across the entire lifespan. So music experiences in childhood can accelerate brain development, particularly in those areas of le reading and language. And learning an instrument can improve math learning and even, even increase SAT scores. So if that's not a reason to learn a musical instrument, I don't know what is. Uh, research has shown that children who learn instruments show better fine motor control, auditory perception, pitch, rhythm discrimination, and they have improved verbal abilities, so verbal recall and reading skills. Making sense of sound is one of the most computationally complex tasks that our brains do, and it does it in a microsecond. So figuring out how a child responds to music, how they process music, can actually really help us identify um, you know, possible deficits early on. So the way a preliterate child processes sound, pitch, timing, timbre, predicts future reading ability. So sound processing can actually be a neurological marker for conditions such as autism, dyslexia, and learning delays. Dancing to music helps children build fine motor skills and allows them to practice, practice self-expression. And then obviously, music sets a mood. It helps us with our emotional and social regulation, and it gives kids something that they can be social with. You bond with your friends over music, or you play instruments together in a band. And so it can make children feel like part of a group, even those children who might not have previously interacted with their peers. So the next uh, clip I'm going to show you is um, a, a school for a developmentally disabled children, um, teenagers, young adults, and how they used music to really tap into these kids. So I'm going to start it, and then we're going to jump ahead um, because the intro is a little bit long. So. All of the students have some form of visual impairment, but then in addition to that, the students also have a whole host of other disabilities. And some of our students, you know, really, it's a challenge. I really was very limited in my knowledge about beatboxing. Things changed, um, I believe it was about eight years ago now. My first experience of coming to Lavelle was through an invitation to come uh, and DJ the school dance. What I saw was uh, just the kids' reaction to music. This isn't just kids listening to music and gaining some joy out of it. This is kids at a visceral, at a human level, like this is ecstasy, this is complete joy, and it's completely unhinged. There's no self-consciousness, there's no uh, 
um, oh, am I dancing well or not? I mean, I'm just wanting to move. This is how I feel. Uh, and that's where I was like, wow. Really saw how powerful music was. Why are we giving the kids 30 minutes worth of music to listen to? Let's teach them how to do it. And let's not only teach them how to do it, let's get the best beatboxers in the world to teach them how to do Guys, it. Guys, make some noise for beat rockers right now. Yeah. Beat rockers is a music and self-expression class that uses beatboxing. We didn't really understand why the art of beatboxing would have been such a great fit for this population of young people. But once we applied it, and once we started to teach the young people, that's when we were like, wow. I can remember like the first week and you could hear this booming through the halls and through the walls. The first class, you could tell that there was definitely something special there. Yeah. Yeah, Carlos. And it was the first oh time gosh, that those verbal. students of ours that are maybe nonverbal, really have a lot of different disabilities, were able to participate in a collaborative project. Okay, and we want to definitely jam out and create some new music with you guys. Okay. But we also have our very, very, very special friend. You guys, make some noise for Harry. Hey! I could watch that video. It's kind of long, but if you guys want to, it's just on YouTube. Uh, you can search When Art Meets Therapy, and it's an amazing watch. Um, so moving farther into the lifespan, obviously uh, adults can benefit from music as well. So studies have shown that musicians actually have less re age-related reductions in brain volume than non-musicians. Listening or making music can increase blood flow to the brain, and especially, like we talked about, those regions that generate emotion. And evidence suggests that listening to music can help brain cells process information more efficiently and facilitate the brain's ability to adapt. So that concept of neuroplasticity that we were talking about earlier. So there was a study published in the scientific journal Brain of adults who suffered a stroke and listened to music every day for the first two months. They experienced greater gains in verbal memory and cognition than those stroke survivors who listened to audiobooks or who didn't listen to anything at all. So listening to music on a daily basis actually helped their brain recover from the stroke better, which is awesome. Um, in 2014, there was actually a movie made about another project of using music with patients with dementia. They called it the iPod Project, and you can probably look that up as well. Um, but basically, I want to show you the trailer for that movie to kind of illustrate the role that music can have um, in the adult world as well. What do you think of music? My heart belongs to music. I, I love it. Have you ever had music just hit you in a place that immediately brought you to tears? Music has that power. Music connects people with who they have been, who they are, and their lives. Because what happens when you get old is all the things you're familiar with and your identity are all just being peeled away. We're going to do your medicine now, right? Our healthcare system imagines the human to be a very complicated machine. We have medicines that can adjust the dials. Blood pressure, oh, turn that down. Blood sugar, oh, turn that down. We haven't done anything to touch the heart and soul of a patient. One resident that barely opened her eyes, she didn't respond. Knew her for two years. Once we put the iPod on her, she started shaking her feet. She started moving her head. It was amazing. Music has more ability to activate more parts of the brain than any other stimulus. Who am I? Huh? Who am I? I'm your daughter. By exciting or awakening those pathways, we have a gateway to stimulate and reach somebody who otherwise is unreachable. Oh. <laughs> it can't get away from me if I'm in this place. It takes me back to my school days. Oh, God, that's, that's beautiful. Does yeah. it make you happy to sing for us? Yeah. I'm crying. Every 
every human being needs stimulation from the outside, from little babies to old people. American culture is wrong. There is actually life beyond adulthood. There's the opportunity to live and grow and become elders. The aging that we experience holds in it very important learnings and lessons. There is no pill that does that. <laughs> So what I love that um, she said in that was that every person needs stimulation from small babies all the way through adulthood and in the later years as well. That's what working your brain out is all about. I tell my patients, it doesn't matter what you do, but you need to do something that's going to work your brain every day. And variety is really the key. You want to do something different. So if you take the same route to work every day, maybe try a different route. If you brush your teeth with your right hand, try brushing your teeth with your left hand. It sounds kind of silly, but uh, it definitely makes you think a little bit harder. Um, board games, card games, jigsaw puzzles, all of those things are good for your brain. Find something that you love and make sure you stimulate your brain. So I think I've already answered this question, but can music be used in speech therapy? Absolutely. Um, so with pediatrics, a lot of times we incorporate musical rewards into therapy. We can make therapy more engaging for kids. We can foster language and practice new words, new phrases. We can build in routine and socializing opportunities. We can build fluency for kids who stutter. And then with adults, we can use music with patients with dementia to help bring back memories, improve engagement and treatment programs. Um, a new uh, study is showing that vibroacoustic therapy, actually, for Parkinson's can help decrease body stiffness, reduce tremors, and give them longer strides. So that's very exciting. Um, music can just help in general with memory processes, mental stimulation, and stress reduction. And it doesn't really matter what diagnosis a person has. I think they could benefit from music. So what can we do right now? What can you do in your life to keep your brain happy and healthy and stimulated? Well, number one, listen to music. And it really doesn't matter what kind of music you listen to. But I will say that um, with the dementia population, we find that music that is familiar to them, music that they remember from their childhood, will often get a bigger response. Um, we also um, can dance. You don't have to be good at it, but physical activity is very good for our brain as well. I often tell my patients heart health equals brain health. So anything that's going to be good for your heart is going to be good for your brain. And so dancing not only helps with that, but it also can help with coordination, balance, following directions. One of the main um, risk factors for older people to have a concussion is falling. And so if they can work on their balance, and keep themselves from falling, we might prevent them from a brain injury. Um, learning. Learn something new, and you're never too old to do this. If you wanted to learn how to play the piano, do it. Learn how to do that. You might learn um, a new song, memorize song lyrics. That helps with not only your memory, but auditory processing and your focus, your attention, your concentration. Your brain is lighting up when you're doing that. Jumpstart your creativity and try listening to music from other cultures, other eras that might open up your mind to different styles and just maybe activate different parts of the brain that you weren't activating before. So to recap, music activates our entire brain. So playing or listening to music are both a total brain workout. Music can help not, not only improve our emotional health, but our, mental, our, our physical health as well. Emotional, mental, and physical. <laughs> music is an important uh, tool to use across the lifespan in improving brain function. And music can be used in therapy, not only speech therapy, but I would say physical therapy, occupational therapy, um, you know, any, any type of rehabilitation to improve outcomes. And we should all try to incorporate music into our daily life. So I did want to leave you with a few resources if you wanted to learn more. Um, so obviously, I'm a little biased, but um, North Kansas City Hospital is amazing. Um, first of all, they allow me to come do things like this. 
Um, and second of all, I think we really do prioritize community education and outreach. So we have an amazing brain series that I started probably four years ago, where quarterly we will have different educational opportunities talking about all kinds of things related to the brain, um, along with all kinds of other community activities. Um, really a good idea if you're interested in the field of speech language pathology, you can check out ASHA's website. That is the American Speech and Hearing Association. Um, there are two books that are a really good illustration of how music impacts our brain. So those are over on the right side there. This is your brain on music and musicophilia. And then that documentary that I was showing you the trailer for earlier, Alive Inside, um, would be a great watch if you were interested in kind of how music um, impacts the brain and, and the results of that amazing um, experiment that they did. All right, that's it. That's all I had for now, but I will open it up to questions. So if anyone has anything, let me know. Yeah, so the question was, do certain types of music impact people who are nonverbal more? And I would say it definitely depends on what they are familiar with. So if it's music that they recognize, you will probably get a bigger response. But let's say we have someone who is very agitated and we're trying to help calm them down. You can be strategic in the music that you play to kind of get them to calm down, or maybe you have someone who's just sitting in the chair, not really doing anything, and you want to get them excited, you know, you might play something that's a little bit more upbeat and exciting. Um, so you can, you can use it to your advantage to get the reaction that you're looking for, and sometimes you might get a reaction you were not expecting, but I would say any kind of a reaction, a response, means that their brain is processing that sound and that music and we're tapping into something. So it's, it's pretty special. Yeah. Um, question, Thanks. Um, like yes. Absolutely. I think, you know, I've, I've heard that quite a bit. Um, you know, obviously I gave some examples of famous musicians who are blind. Um, and I would say that they probably have, you know, superpowers with their hearing because of that. Um, but it's really interesting because on the flip side, pe people who are deaf can also sense and enjoy music. So there's a lot of really cool, um, you know, sh documentaries on that as well. Um, but the one that's coming to my mind right now is Mr. Holland's Opus, if anybody's ever seen that movie. He had a son, he was a, a conductor, he had a son who was deaf. And his son wound up being able to feel the vibration of the music. And he was dancing and enjoying the music and he couldn't hear. And so it does, it taps into all kinds of things with people with all kinds of, you know, maybe visual impairments, hearing impairments. Um, but they can appreciate music in their own way. Yeah. Yeah. Anybody else? All right. Thank you guys so much. I really appreciate your attention, and um, I hope you guys have a great rest of your weekend. <laughs>